All right, what's going on everyone? So I recently implemented this infinite scrolling feed into Web Dev Daily. How it works is once you scroll to the bottom of the page, it's going to trigger a function to retrieve more data to display within your UI. So in this video, I'll show you exactly how I went ahead and created this. Are you ready? Let's get started. Now, before we jump in and get started, I do want to mention that I'll be showing you how to do this within Nux 3. However, we won't be using any libraries, so you could use a logic that I'm going to be showing you in mainly any other type of framework with just a few tweaks. And for the API request to retrieve the data, we're going to be using Supabase. All right, so here inside of VS Code, I have a cloned repo of Web Dev Daily open. Now what we're doing is first off, we're using what is called a use async data function, and we're using this to go ahead and reach out to Supabase to retrieve the starting data that we have on the page. And within the template, we're using a simple v4 loop to iterate over the data that we're getting back from Supabase, and we're outputting a challenge card for each value that we have inside of this array. And here within the application, this is what we have. So what we want to do is we want to listen for when a user scrolls to the bottom of the page here. And once we do that, or once we have scrolled to the bottom, we then want to make a additional API request to our database or the API to get some more data to display here inside of the UI. All right, so we're going to begin by creating some variables. The first one's going to be called fetching data, and we'll set this equal to a ref with the initial value of false. And we're going to use this to track when we're fetching new values from the API. Next, we have a variable called all data fetched, and we're going to set this equal to a ref with the initial value of false. And we're going to use this to track once we have retrieved all the values from our database. And lastly, we're going to create a variable called offset, and we're going to set this equal to a ref once again, but this time we're going to give it the value of 12. And what we're going to use as variable four is to inform the API where in terms of order we want to start retrieving records from. So for example, many APIs will accept what is called an offset query or an offset parameter. And by default, if you didn't pass anything, then it would be zero. Now, in this case, if we had the offset set to say something like 12, like we do in this variable, then what it's going to do is if you pass the API this variable, it's going to skip the first 12 records in the actual database. All right, so next we're going to create an asynchronous function that we're going to be using to obtain more values from our database, and we'll just call this fetch solutions. Inside this function, we'll just go ahead and create what is called a try catch block to catch any errors that could occur, and then we'll just log out those errors to the console for the sake of this tutorial. Now inside of our try block, we'll start off by initializing our loading state by setting our variable of fetching data to true. Now we're going to use this value or this variable to dynamically display a loading spinner while the API is fetching more results. Next, we're going to make our API request to Supabase, and the important part to note here with this are these two methods that we have attached to our client called range and then limit. The range method is very similar to the offset parameter or offset query that I mentioned earlier. However, with Supabase, the range method actually accepts two values. It accepts a starting point, but it also accepts an ending point resulting in what is called a range. Now, a way around to avoid doing a calculation to determine an ending point is to only define a starting value here within the range. And then what we can do is use the limit method to limit the number of results that are returned. And with our offset value set to 12, and then we have a limit variable that I'm not sure that I've shown you, but this is also set to 12. And what this is going to do is it's going to return 12 results starting at the 13th record since we're skipping the first initial 12. So after we make this call, what we want to do is check to see if we have any errors returned from Supabase. So what we can do is an if check and we're to structure not only the data that we get back, but also the error from Supabase if we have one. So if we have an error and this is true, then what we want to do is we want to stop our loading state and then we're just going to throw a new error and then we're going to go ahead and include that error that we get back from Supabase. So if we don't have any errors, the next thing we want to do is then we're going to update our offset value. So what we're going to say is we're going to reference our offset variable dot value, and then we're going to set it equal to the current offset dot value. And then we're just going to add on our limit. And the reason why we want to do this is because the next time that this function runs, we not only want to skip the first initial 12 records, but we also now want to skip the 12 records that we just retrieved. 
Now, after we update our offset value, then what we want to do is we want to add our new values to our initial data. So we're going to reference the data.value.solutions, which we're getting back here from our initial use async data function. And then we're going to use what is called the concat method to go ahead and add our array of data to our current array of data that we have here within the data.value.solutions. And the last thing that we'll want to do is we want to check to see if the length of the array that we're getting back is less than our limit. And if it is, what this means is that we have retrieved all the values from our database. So what we can do is we can set our variable of all data fetch to true. And that's all we need to do. So now that we have all of our function defined, we can stop our loading state by setting our fetching data variable to false. And we also want to set this to false if we do encounter an error as well. All right, so now that we have this function to retrieve additional paginated data, we need to detect once we get to the bottom of the screen to invoke this function. And to do this, we're gonna be using what is called an intersection observer. And for those that may not be aware of what this is, the intersection observer is a JavaScript API that allows you to efficiently monitor the visibility and intersection of HTML elements within a container or the viewport itself. So what we're going to do is within our template, we're going to add a blank div or what could be known as a invisible element just beneath our grid. And what we'll do is observe this element using an intersection observer and whatever it becomes visible, we can then invoke our function. And also to target this element within our script tag, which we're gonna be doing, we need to pass it a ref and we'll just give it the value of trigger L. And then within our script tag, what we want to do is you want to create a variable that has the same name as our ref of trigger L, and then we'll set it equal to an empty ref. Now to observe this element, we'll start by creating a new function. And inside of this function, we'll create a new variable and we'll call this observer, and then we'll set it equal to a new intersection observer. Now this accepts a callback and the callback is going to be triggered or it's going to run each time that the element's visibility state changes, meaning that it either enters or exits the container's visible area. Now this callback also accepts a parameter and we're going to call this entries and this entries parameter is actually an array of objects and each one of the objects is going to contain or represent the observed elements intersection information. And the intersection observer also accepts a second value, which is an object, which we can then configure some additional options for the intersection observer itself. Now within this callback, what we want to do is we want to perform an if check to see if the element is intersecting or visible within the viewport. And we're able to check for that by grabbing the first entry within our array of entries. And then on here, we have access to a property called is intersecting. And if this is true, what we want to do is then run our function of fetch solutions. Now, as I mentioned, we have this object that we can use to configure some additional properties for the observer. And for this feature, we're going to define what is called a threshold property. Now, the value of this property can be either set from zero to one. And what this determines is when the value or the element is deemed to be intersecting. And for this example, you can see we have the threshold set to one. And what this means is that the element must be fully visible in order for it to be considered intersecting. And definitely feel free to play around with this number if you like, but I did find that one seemed to work pretty good for this. And now that we have our observer set within this function, the last thing we want to do is observe the element itself of trigger L. And we can do this by just going beneath our observer inside of our function. And then what we want to do is we want to reference our observer variable. And on here we have access to a method called observe. And then we just want to pass in our element of trigger L. And then all we want to do is just invoke this function once we load into the page. Now, since we are using Nux and we don't have access to the DOM on the initial page load since it is server side rendered, we just want to use what is called the unmounted lifecycle hook. And then once the application has been mounted and we have access to the DOM, we then want to invoke our function. All right, so here inside of the browser, if we did everything correctly, now once we scroll down to the bottom of the page, we should be getting in more results. And as you can see there, once we got to the bottom, we had new results loaded in. So if we scroll down to the bottom, more results are gonna keep loading in as we get to the bottom of the page each and every time. 
Okay, so to improve the look and feel of this feed while loading in new data, we can actually use a few of the variables we created earlier, which were called fetching data and all data fetch to add a nice loading animation to inform users when new data is being fetched. So for the loading state, I'm just going to be using Iconify, which if you never heard of it, is a really awesome icon framework and my go-to whenever I need to add icons to a project. So we're going to add this really nice loading icon and we're only going to show it if our fetching data variable is set to true. Then we'll also add another element to inform users that all data has been fetched and what we'll use here is a v else if directive and we'll only want to show this if our all data fetch variable is set to true and then we'll display this message right here saying you've reached the end. All right, so back here inside of the application, if we now scroll to the bottom of the page, we're going to see that nice loading animation while our data is being retrieved. Okay, so our infinite loading feed is working quite well. However, there is an edge case that I want to cover. The issue that we could potentially have is going to be with the observer. What could happen is a user could potentially scroll up and down really quickly, resulting in this function firing multiple times, and we don't want that. We only want it to fire once. And we should be able to see this happen if we just do a simple console.log and we say hello. And here inside of the browser, let's see if we can replicate this. So first let's open up our console. And if we scroll down to the bottom really quickly and we scroll back up, as you can see, our console of hello was outputted twice. And what that means is our function was ran twice, which is what we don't want. Now, it's probably very unlikely that a user is going to scroll up and down very quickly at the bottom of your page, but it's always a good idea to check for those edge cases. So how we can fix this is by using something called a debounce. So what we can do first is we'll create a new variable and we'll just call this timer and we'll set this equal to a new ref with the initial value of nothing. Now here inside of this if block, I'm going to remove our function of fetch solutions and then I'm going to paste in some code. So what we have here is a clear timeout method and we're passing it in our timer variable dot value and this is going to clear our timeout. And then what we're doing beneath this is we're setting our timer dot value and we're setting this equal to a new set timeout method. And this function is going to execute after 300 milliseconds. So how this works is, as we seen earlier when we were scrolling up and down very quickly, this went ahead and logged out twice. So in this scenario now, what's going to happen is if it was to be ran twice, we're first going to run this clear timeout method, which currently has nothing in it. But beneath this, we're actually setting the value of our timer to a new set timeout method, and we're going to run our fetch solutions function after 300 milliseconds. So if this was to fire twice, what's going to happen is before it can actually run, it's going to clear that timeout. Therefore, it's not going to execute the function twice. It'll just execute the function once after 300 milliseconds have passed. And we can get a better understanding how this works visually if we go up to our function of fetch solutions and we can just add another console.log and we'll say fetching like this. And instead of this being 300 milliseconds, this should actually be five. And back within the application now, if we scroll to the bottom and scroll up very quickly, you can see that although we do see console.log of hello twice, we only see that our fetching log was ran one time, meaning that our function was only ran once. Now, one additional thing that we can fix now that we have our debounce is if we get to the bottom, you can see it takes about a half a second for our loading animation to appear. And to fix this, we can move where we're initializing our loading state. So instead of having it within our function of fetch solutions, let's copy this and remove it. And we can also remove this console.log. And where we want to add this is to our function where we have our observer. So instead of having this console.log of hello, let's just initialize our loading state here. And now if we scroll to the bottom of our page, you can see that the loading animation is going to be there right away. All right, so that's going to wrap it up for this video. Hopefully you enjoyed it and you're able to learn something new. If you did, be sure to leave a like on it down below and be sure to subscribe for more content like this. And if you do want to see a working demo of this, I'll leave a link down below in the description to Web Dev Daily. Anyways, thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Take care.